Well, welcome to this last video cast in Chapter 8. Make sure you've got this page in front of you that says Section 8.8, 10th 8, edition of Brunlum A. Burston, Strength of Covalent Bonds. We're going to talk about the strength of covalent bonds today, the length of covalent bonds today, and the enthalpy associated with breaking those bonds. And then we'll do one long integrative exercise that kind of wraps up most of Chapter 8. So I have this paper in front of you. I also have a periodic table handy because it'll help you when we draw a few Lewis dot structures throughout this chapter or throughout this portion of the chapter as well. In this section of the chapter, we talk about bond strength. Bond strength is also known as bond enthalpy because the stability of a molecule is related to the strength of its covalent bonds. The strength of a covalent bond between two atoms is determined by the energy required to break that bond. And it's the easiest to relate the bond strength to the enthalpy change in reactions in which bonds are broken. For example, we can have a bond like this between chlorine and chlorine. And we'd say, how much energy does it take to put into the system to bust this bond right here. So we'd end up with two chlorine atoms, two chlorine atoms like this. And this measurement occurs in the gaseous phase. And this is defined as the enthalpy change or the enthalpy to break this bond, sometimes known as bond enthalpy. Well, bond enthalpies for a lot of different bonds have been calculated and tabulated for us. And on page 330 of the 10th edition of Brown LeMay Burston, there's a table. It's table 8.4, and it looks like this. And if I zoom in on it a little bit, you can see that there's uh, a lot of data here about different kinds of bonds and the energy associated with breaking it. Notice they're all in kilojoules per mole and a carbon hydrogen bond it takes 413 kilojoules to break a mole of them. You can see down here carbon-carbon double bond is about 614. Carbon-carbon triple bond is about 839. Down here on the bottom and you can see a bunch of other bonds over here too. You'll notice one unique thing about all of these bond enthalpies is that they're positive. Every single number on here is positive, which means in terms of enthalpy, it's an endothermic process, meaning energy must be put into the reaction. All bond enthalpies are endothermic, meaning that their delta H is positive. You gotta put energy in to break that bond. Well, let's take a look at a sample problem. It says using table 8.4, the one we just looked at, estimate the delta H for the following reaction. Well, we can estimate the enthalpy of a reaction, the delta H of this entire reaction here, by taking a look at the energy it takes to break the bonds of the reactants, and then, which would be a positive delta H, and then take a look at the energy released when, uh, which is a negative delta H, uh, when, when the bonds are formed. So breaking bonds, remember, is always endothermic, and uh, when we form bonds, it's exothermic, and energy is released. And we can write this actually as an equation where we say delta H of the reaction is equal to the, and, and, and I'll use this Greek uh, sigma for summation, the summation of the bonds broken minus the summation or the addition of the bonds formed in the reaction. And notice it's broken minus formed, which is a little bit different from the enthalpies of formation we used before. Because in the enthalpies of formation, we always did products minus reactants. Here it's actually the reactants minus the products. 
to uh, find the enthalpy of a particular reaction. So to be able to know what kind of bonds we have, of course, we need to know the Lewis electron dot structures for each one of the reactants and the products so we know what kind of bonds we're dealing with. And so C2H6 has a Lewis electron dot structure that looks like this. Uh, O2, or oxygen, is O with a double bond and some unshared pairs of electrons. Carbon dioxide looks like this. We're going to assume that there's a couple of double bonded O's in there. And then the last thing is water, which is uh, this type of structure right here. And remember that there's uh, three of these waters. There's two of these carbon dioxides right here that are formed. There's seven halves running out of space here of this uh, oxygen, seven and a half moles of it, and then there's one mole of this C C2H6. So in terms of bonds broken and bonds formed, in terms of bonds broken and bonds formed, we have uh, six carbon-hydrogen bonds right here that are going to have to be broken. We have um, seven halves of an oxygen oxygen double bond that need to be broken minus the bonds that are formed and there's uh, two I'm sorry two of these molecules but two times two per molecule is actually four of the C double bond O's inside of here and there are three times two bonds per molecule so six O to H bonds inside of the water molecule. And then we can look on the table, the table that I showed you before on page uh, 330 of the 10th edition. If you have a different edition, it'll be on a different page of bond enthalpies right here. And we can look up what the strength of each bond enthalpy is and put it into the equation. So if you have your textbook in front of you, you can look these up. Or you can just follow along with me and trust that I'm looking up the right answers or the right numbers. Um, a carbon-hydrogen bond is uh, 413 kilojoules. An oxygen-oxygen double bond is 495 kilojoules. A carbon-oxygen double bond is uh, 799 kilojoules. Notice I multiplied by 4, and this one's going to be multiplied by 6. And this is an oxygen-hydrogen uh, single bond, which is 463 kilojoules. So run my calculator through these, run my calculator through these, and subtract the two. And I end up with uh, a, a, an enthalpy of reaction close to negative 1416 kilojoules for burning or uh, for breaking um, for this combustion reaction of ethanol. You can see that it's quite exothermic, which would make sense because uh, if you burn ethanol, it uh, gives off a lot of energy. Um, Bond enthalpy actually gives rise to a really important part in chemistry uh, that, that uh, talks about uh, breaking bonds, breaking bonds and forming bonds, and this gives rise or gives gives a good illustration of something that burns. But the things that burn uh, very rapidly or change very rapidly are sometimes called explosives. And explosives, of course, are extremely useful in, in, in mining and in construction and uh, you know building roads and bridges. And if you look on page 332 of your textbook, there's actually a really nice little article called Chemistry at Work and Explosives and Alfred Nobel. And they talk about a little bit of the history of uh, creation of explosives. Alfred Nobel, of course, was uh, the gentleman who created uh, and was named after the or the Nobel Prize was actually named after him, and he's uh, one of the first that uh, really worked in depth with a lot of uh, not one of the first, but one of that was really uh, is successful in in working with explosives, and uh, was kind of considered the fourth forefather of uh, TNT and eventually dynamite. 
and you can see one of the uh, one of the characteristic explosives that he worked with was uh, called nitroglycerin. And one thing that makes an explosive very good is if they have fairly weak bond strength throughout the explosive, the, the explosive itself, because then it doesn't take a lot of bond energy to break it. And here's, here's uh, nitroglycerin right here. I'll zoom in on the reaction. And you can see that there's a bunch of bonds that are going to break. But then if you look over here on the right-hand side, the bonds that form are extremely strong. And so since it doesn't take a lot of energy, relatively, to break these bonds, but when these bonds form, a ton of energy is released. And you can see lots and lots of bonds are, bonds are formed. You know, 24 carbon-oxygen double bonds, uh, 6 nitrogen-nitrogen triple bonds, and then a whole bunch of water bonds and, uh, you know, another double-double bond in oxygen as well. It releases a ton of energy because it doesn't take much to break the bonds, and it releases a lot of energy when these bonds are formed. So uh, the the other thing that makes an explosive really good is that uh, the products uh, are in their gaseous phase, so that a whole bunch of gas pressure accompanies the decomposition, and we want it to occur rapidly. So then a lot of these gaseous products are formed in a hurry, because then they'll explode. Oh, that's the that's the actual word for it, and um, have a large change in pressure, forcing a lot of things to move. So take a look at that. That's on page 332 and 333 in your textbook. Uh, if you have the 10th edition. Bond enthalpy gives rise to something called bond length. Bond length is actually like the physical distance between uh, two substances or two, two, two atoms. And this, the enthalpy and the length are directly related to one another. And on page 333 of your textbook, the one that had the Alfred Nobel and explosives on it, they have a table, table 8.5, that actually lists the bond lengths of various, uh, various atoms stuck together. For example, a carbon-carbon double bond has an average bond length of 1.54 angstroms. A carbon-carbon double bond has an average bond length of 1.34. <coughs> and a carbon-carbon triple bond has an average bond length of 1.2. <coughs> These are all in angstroms, by the way. And uh, you can notice that as the bond becomes stronger, more enthalpies and more energy is needed to break it, the bond becomes shorter which is the general rule and the general characteristic. The more bonds, the stronger the bond, and therefore the stronger the bond, the shorter the bond. The bond grows shorter and the bond grows stronger. So take a look at that on page 333. Um, and just make sure that you know the general rule of thumb. And once again, the enthalpies for this was uh, 348 kilojoules per mole for a single, single bond. For a double bond, it was um, uh, 614. And for a triple bond, it was 839. And I write these down not just so you see that you know bond enthalpy increases as you have number of bonds, but also so you can see that the bond shortens. And then to ask an interesting question, you know, if this is a carbon-carbon single bond and it's about 350, how come a carbon-carbon double bond isn't 700? You know, because 350 times 2 is 700. How come this bond energy isn't just simply double? Because it's a double bond. And this one, this is a triple bond. Why isn't it triple 350? I mean, it should be well over 1,000. Well, pay attention in Chapter 9, because we're going to actually talk about the nature of these double and triple bonds and what makes them, what makes them be. So the second and the second and the third in this one bond aren't quite as strong as just the single bond right here. So a little foreshadowing to Chapter 9 for you to uh, remember bond length and bond strength depends on the type of bond. Let's take a look at this putting it all together question. This is an overall example problem from chapter 8. And this one puts a bunch of the concepts together from, from the chapter and actually forces you to remember a little bit from previous chapters as well. It says, Phosgene, a substance used in a poisonous gas warfare, is named because it was first prepared by the action of sunlight on a mixture of carbon monoxide and chlorine gases. Its name comes from the Greek phos and genus, which means born of, and phosgene 
has the following co chemical composition, 12% carbon, 16% oxygen, and 71% chlorine by its, uh, by its mass. And its molar mass is 98.9 grams per mole. And the first question is letter A, determine its uh, molecular formula. And I'm gonna work this entire problem here so you can remember how to find the molecular formula by knowing the percentage composition. So the first thing to do when you're given percentages is to assume something, and I'm gonna assume 100 gram sample. So there's 12.14 grams of carbon, 16.17 grams of oxygen, and 71.69 grams of chlorine. And after I do that then, when in doubt, convert to moles. So I'm gonna take each one of these and convert it to moles of carbon, moles of oxygen, moles of chlorine. When I do that, there's 12 grams in one mole, 16 grams in one mole. Um, and then uh, 35.45 grams in one mole here. And if you want to take your calculator out, you can check my math along the way. This turns out to be 1.011 moles. This turns out to be 1.011 moles. And this turns out to be 2.022 moles. Once I have the number of moles of each of these, then I take them to get the smallest whole number ratio and divide by the smallest. So divide by 1.011 moles. And when I do this, when I do this, it turns out that there's uh, one carbon, one oxygen, and two chlorines. So there is my um, empirical formula. This is the simplest whole number ratio between carbons, oxygens, and chlorines. Now, if you look up in the problem, it gave me the uh, molar mass of the entire formula. And I know that the molar mass is 98.9 grams per mole. And this is equal to some number n times whatever the empirical formula mass is. Um, the empirical formula uh, mass is 98.9 as well when I add this up on the periodic table. 12 plus 16 plus 35.5 times 2. And so the number n right here has to be equal to 1, which means I multiply each one of the subscripts by 1. And so my molecular formula is the same as my empirical formula. And there's my formula for this uh, poisonous gas, phosgene. So that answers question A. Then letter B, it says draw the Lewis electron dot structure for the molecule that satisfies the octet rule. So I've got carbon, oxygen, and two chlorines. Carbon has four electrons in its outer structure. If you look on the periodic table, remember we can find carbon here in group 14. So it has four. Oxygen's gonna have six. And then we've got uh, two chlorines in there as well, so that's gonna have seven valence electrons. So six here, and then seven times two. So my total number of valence electrons then is 14 plus six, that's 20 or 24. Take the least electronegative atom, which would be carbon, and stick it in the middle. So put carbon in the middle. And then uh, bond everything else around it if you can. So I'm gonna put a chlorine here, and a chlorine here, and I'm gonna put an oxygen here. And if I just try it from there, uh, the uh, electrons won't work because I gotta go six, six, and six, and that's 18, 20, 22, 24. But carbon would not have a complete octet of electrons. So if that doesn't work, let's try double bond. And oxygen's pretty fancy at double bonding. So now I've used up two, four, six, eight electrons, and 24 minus eight leaves me enough to go two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 16 plus 8 is 24. So that's a, a possible um, um, formula for phosgene. Now somebody might say, well, what about if I double bonded a chlorine? And, and I could do that. I could do that. Single bond this guy. Single bond this guy. And then what about this other chlorine? Could I do that? Sure, sure, sure. Double bond this chlorine this chlorine, make sure it's a chlorine, and then single bond this guy. 
many of you remember back from earlier in chapter 8, um, you know, all these structures satisfy what they asked. They said, draw three Lewis dot structures of the molecule that satisfy the octet rule. All three do. We could go through and we could assign formal charges to find which is the most significant, but you know, in terms of which one it is, um, they all are maybe slightly possible. I think that we'd find that this one, if we assign formal charges, would probably be the most significant, but there's a chance that it resonates to these possible ones as well. This is the most important because it, uh, it's going to have the lowest uh, the lowest um, formal charges, and that's what letter C asks. It says using formal charges to determine which Lewis structure is the most important. So let's go through and do that so we can prove that. Uh, to assign formal charges, um, we take the uh, number of electrons assigned to it. Uh, on the periodic table, minus the number of electrons assigned to it in the structure, so this turns out to be zero. This one's seven assigned to it, and seven on the structure, so zero. And this one's six minus six, zero, and this one, seven minus seven, zero. So you can see all of them get a formal charge of zero. This one right here, um, four assigned to it, and four here. This one, uh, seven, uh, on the periodic table, minus 7 is 0. This one um, has uh, 6 on the periodic table, minus 7 assigned to it here, so a negative 1 formal charge right here. And this one, um, uh, 7 assigned to it on the periodic table, minus 6 assigned to it here in the, in the uh, Lewis electron dot structure, you'd end up with positive 1. So this structure right here ends up with formal charges of negative 1 here, positive 1 here. Remember, having zeros uh, makes it be the most significant or, or probably the most important. This one right here ends up with the same thing, negative 1 here. This one ends up with um, uh, the same thing we had over here, so one, this would be zero, and this would be zero. So these two right here end up with formal charges that are non-zero, whereas this one ends up with formal charges that are all zero, so it's probably the most important. Lastly, it says in letter D, using average bond enthalpies, estimate the delta H for the formation of gaseous phosgene from CO and CL. And so we need to take CO and uh, be able to add that to some chlorine. And then we need to make uh, the phosgene, which is COCl2 right here. And here, you know, drawing the Lewis electron dot structures, this would be um, carbon monoxide, chlorine, bonded to chlorine for this structure. And then over here, we know that the most important structure here that we found was the C in the middle, the chlorines around it, and then the double bonded oxygen right here. And we can see that uh, that equation's actually balanced this way as well. There's one of these, one of these, and one of these that's gonna form for balancing it for charge. And we can see that we're going to end up breaking this bond. We're going to end up breaking this bond right here. And then uh, we're going to end up forming two of these bonds and one of this carbon-oxygen bonds right here. So to estimate the enthalpy of the reaction by using bond enthalpies, we're going to take and look up the bond enthalpies for each one of these things. Uh, a carbon oxygen triple bond has a bond enthalpy of 1072. The bond enthalpy for a chlorine chlorine bond is 242. That's the bonds that are broken minus the bonds that are formed. And in this case, we've got two of the chlorine carbon bonds right here. And the chlorine carbon bonds are um, 328 kilojoules per mole. And the carbon oxygen bond right here is 799 kilojoules per mole. 
And so uh, remember the answer to this is going to be in kilojoules because all of these are in kilojoules. And these are the bonds broken and these are the bonds formed just like we learned earlier in the video cast. And if I run that through my calculator, I think I get negative 141 kilojoules and it's an exothermic process in the forming or formation of phosgene. So in this video cast, we talked about bond enthalpy and that it takes energy to break a bond and bond, and bond energy is released when we form a bond. We talked about bond length and we also uh, summarized the entire chapter a little bit by doing some Lewis electron dot structure drawing, some uh, creation of formal charges and then uh, using bond enthalpy again for the gas phosgene. Good luck with your Lewis dot structures and bond enthalpies.